Welcome back to the Blue Door Pop Thunderdome for another bull with Andy Carlson. This is a 7th Best Daily Podcast, a show about everything and nothing. Sports adjacent. Five days a week. Tell a friend, spread the word, and to the Jerome Army, because everyone's middle name is Jerome. iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, BullShow.co. Also like us on Facebook. Yeah, uh, We got Blythe Brumlev, uh, she of Girls... Damn it. Uh, guys. We got Blive Brumlev, founder of GuysGirl.com. A uh, huge Jaguars fan, does, does some uh, Jaguars radio down in Jacksonville as well. And I wanted to have her on because she's in a similar vein as I am, where she's just a bootstrapping, grinding, working, making something of yourself hustler. And there, there's a lot of people that I respect in the sports media game who are going the similar route as myself. And Blythe is definitely one of them. She, she's doing it way better than me. So <laughs> it's uh, admiration and jeal- jealousy all rolled into one. Mm-hmm. Uh, but before we, we get her in, uh, I'm going to be cryptic. I'm going to be very Brett favre about what I'm really trying to say. Visit RSV. T, and the T is in T, like the beverage, T-E-A. So spelling it out phonetically, not phonetically, you know what I mean, uh, R-S-V-T-E-A dot com and follow them on Instagram, the brand new beverage. Just do that. Check out the website, follow them on Instagram, do that. Uh, very cryptic, very, very cryptic. Let's get into it with Blythe. And coming in to Thunderdome is Bly Brumley. Follow her on Twitter at Bly the Brum. She's the founder of Girl uh, Guys Girl. Damn it, GuysGirl.com. I always screw these up. It happens. <laughs> also, helmet and heels on Ten Ten XL ninety two five, the flagship station in Jacksonville. Yeah. Now, what do they do besides? Is that all sports talk, or is they play music on there? No, it, it's all sports talk from oh. from morning until night. Oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, so it's like uh, our, our K fan up here equivalent. Yeah, it's like a, the, the, pretty much the Jaguars' official mm-hmm. radio station is, is 1010XL. And then they also cover local sports, so the the, the minor league teams around mm-hmm. town, uh, the Gators, the Seminoles, things like that. You know, it's funny, the not, not disparaging anyone at all, but I'm going to disparage people. That, that's how you always uh, uh, establish that you're not going to talk bad about people. <laughs> I, I love your guys' website. I love K-Fan's website, except the, it's all a little dated. It is slightly. I, I think you can tell the, yeah. the the old school radio people mm. in, in the industry just simply based off of their digital presence. No, nah, I understand. Like Windows 95 was big for me, too, when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, yeah, enough about the website. Uh, Blythe, thanks for coming on. Uh, oh, by the way, props to being named Blythe. That's big. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to consider it my own personal accomplishment. It's uh, unique, and I've always liked it because it mean, doesn't mean happy. Or it means like that. joyful. Yeah, close enough. So same, same thing. Yeah, it, it's nice. It's unique, and it, it's cool to meet someone uh, like a, a woman who in her twenties who's not named Chloe, or oh, <laughs> uh, what, what was the big names? Uh, girls my age, like Stacy or Kimberly. Kelly. Yeah, or... that's what I used when I was younger. I didn't fully embrace mm. my name just yet, so I wanted people to call me Kelly because I really loved the nine oh two nine oh two one oh. Um, and Kelly was my favorite character on nine oh two one oh. Oh, not um um. Saved by the Bell? Is it? Was it Saved by the Bell? Uh, no, I, there are two Kellys. Well, chances are, since 90210 was a 90 show, there was a Kelly on there. I mean, there had to be. I'm pretty sure there was definitely, yeah, because there was, <laughs> uh, she was uh, involved with Dylan, who is mm. the bad boy on the show. Uh, and So, yeah, there, 90210 and definitely Saved by the Bell. By the way, we got to be careful. We're dating ourselves. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I watched them all on Netflix. Oh, yeah, we'll go with that. Uh, so, <laughs> Blythe, I want to have you on because you're a hustler, and I, I love and respect all the hustlers in the same vein as myself. So why don't you tell me a little about uh, a little bit about yourself, uh, Guys Girl, and how you got on 1010XL. G- give me the whole story. Sure, sure. So full story is I started blogging back in 2009 when it was sort of a, a new medium. It got on Twitter around that time as well. Yeah, back when the Jaguars and... were good. Yes. Um, well, technically, we were okay in 2009. 2010 was really our shining glory because we won four or five home games that year. So that's really the, the, the season that we hang a lot of our hats on for a lot of the millennial 
Jaguar fan base. Um, but I got started in 2009, started covering uh, sports and entertainment. So uh, video games, movies, mm -hmm. and then just the, the major sports, a lot of Jaguars coverage in that as well. I joined a couple different blogging networks and back when blogging networks, I think were still a thing. Mm -hmm. And it, it sort of evolved from there. I maintained my independent status because I always thought, you know, being a media publisher, having that independent status w was really, really important. Also Beyonce. And Yes, also Beyonce too. And then um, I got a I got a gig with a local magazine here in town in Jacksonville. It's North Florida Entertainment Lifestyle Magazine, and that's where I really feel like a lot of my uh, I guess creative juices started flowing. Was working with sort of a, in an agency, a marketing agency environment learning the you know proper digital marketing techniques and mm -hmm. uh, strategy headlines all that all that different stuff that you have to learn whenever you're you're essentially a a content creator a solo content creator managing a team of writers 17 reasons why the jaguars will make the playoffs this year number 7 <laughs> will shock you Yes. Not so clickbaity. I like to pride myself. I did, you know, yeah. everybody has to sort of experiment mm -hmm. with those techniques, but um, I definitely like to, I, with Guys Girl, I've always prided myself on, on being more evergreen than, mm -hmm. I guess, news-based. Uh, so after working for a local magazine here in town, I got an opportunity to write for a college sports site um, that's actually no longer in operation anymore, um, but I also got a gig with the local radio station, too. Oh, so cool. since then, uh, since starting with with 1010, I've since evolved a little bit into having my own show called The Guys Girl Show on in iTunes, Periscope, Facebook Live, that whole thing, because I, I found a lot of freedom and not being tied to sort of, I guess, FCC regulations mm -hmm. and um, sponsors and things like that. I really like the sort of editorial freedom that you have with those live streaming shows, turn them into podcasts, that sort of thing. Um, so that's really the past eight years of my life sort of condensed into about five minutes. Now, it's very impressive that you started this all in middle school. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very talented 12-year-old. Mm, no. Uh, the AOL chat oh. messenger rooms. God. Now, we're dating ourselves again. The whole AOL thing of... Doo -doo 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 -doo. Those are good memories. Very good memories. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the podcast and the non-FCC regulations. That's one of the reasons why I sort of drifted into podcasting, too. But is it more just uh, having the freedom to do whatever you want, or did you just want to curse? Um, Both of those things. <laughs> Because if, if you, I, I think anybody who's worked in sort of mainstream radio sort of knows mm -hmm. that you're you're a little bit handcuffed when it comes to what you can say and what you can't say. Yeah. It's sort of a, a wink, wink, nod sort of deal. And mm -hmm. and I I love the aspect of live streaming because it's it, usually it's just you and another person or it's just you in front of a camera and it feels like it, it feels more honest it feels more authentic and that's sort of what i have based my entire career on is having that honest opinion that whether i'm going to i'm going to say an opinion in front of my group of friends or i'm going to say mm -hmm. it online it's going to be the same so that's what i really find almost very extremely valuable about going on periscopes and doing live stream shows and having a podcast is that you can have that sort of relationship with your listeners without, you know, worrying mm -hmm. about the red tape of, you know, is a sponsor going to get mad because I said this. Yeah. Uh, see, that's the cool thing too uh, about podcasts and having like a YouTube channel and periscope, like you mentioned is that the, the barrier to entry to building up a large media following is, is significantly dissipated like exponentially gone down whereas you know 10 15 years ago if you wanted to get on the radio you had to deal with program directors and bureaucracy and song and dance and even then it's still like is it worth it at this point yes and that's what i really i always struggled with with that sort of side of the of the business i i don't like a, I, i'm not a big politics person or mm -hmm. inner office politics person that means she loves trump <laughs> so I know yeah. it does not, <laughs> but um, it definitely it it gives you your own audience, and mm -hmm. I think that any time that you can command your own audience for the work that you're producing, it's always a greater value than creating that same content or trying to create that same content for another company. Yeah, and I, I'm at this point now where we built up the audience with the podcast been running for a couple of years now it's really awesome we have a nice grassroots 
community here and sort of flirting with the idea of getting into radio. But then everyone I talk to in radio is like, ah, I, I miss the freedom, man. Like, like there's so many overlords and oversight and air checks and, and I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I, I'm at a crossroads. Do you get that same feeling? I, I yes, I, I definitely understand that same feeling because you you can't speak as freely because you're working for a company and that company has a certain brand, they have a certain vision that they have in line, and they have certain companies that they like to work with, and they don't want to upset any of them. And you could say something that uh, you know editorially is is your opinion, but then you could be punished for it later on down the line if the sponsor gets upset or and and I imagine that that's the same for a lot of companies, but in radio in particular, especially when it's your job to give your opinion and you are handcuffed on that opinion, that's where it gets particularly frustrating. At least for me it does. Yeah, and it, it does feel like some stations, yeah, specifically sports stations, boil it down to the lowest common denominator, which, you know, that's per- their prerogative, just trying to cast a wide net as possible. But then you're like, uh, our uh, going down to Jacksonville is like, is Blake Bortles still the franchise quarterback or the do the Jaguars need to draft a quarterback? And then you have 10 days of that. <sighs> that gets a little trying. Where, yes. <laughs> where you have to take a fake position is like, oh, okay, today I'm going to say oh, we should draft a guy. We should take Pat Mahomes. It'd be great. Absolutely. Because especially with dealing with this franchise and the losing records year after year after year, mm-hmm. it gets particularly exhausting to try to find a new angle to cover, like you just said. But it, it also, th- there's other topics that are more interesting. I think we're dealing with shortened attention spans in the world of sports, in the world of entertainment, and people want to talk about the water cooler topics, and it's mm-hmm. not necessarily the, the third string tight end on the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's not interesting to the majority of people. So I would I would argue that for a lot of my focus, especially for, for the Guys Girl show, is to focus on the topics that people mm-hmm. are already talking about, not necessarily trying to force something down your throat just because – it's it's the local team in the area that you have to talk about and you have to try to force the topic. Third string tight end. How dare you disparage Julius Thomas like that? <laughs> he is no longer on the team. Thank yeah, God. No. Yeah, the, I, I'm trying to think like who's been the most frustrating player in fantasy sports in the past decade. I think Julius Thomas might be up there. He could be up there. I would argue maybe like a Danny Woodhead. He <sighs> was very frustrating yeah. for a couple years. Um, basically any Patriots running back. Oh Past yeah, well, yeah. Just avoid that old dice game. Yeah, you, you have no idea if Jonas Gray is going to come on run for four touchdowns. He's not even on the team, but Belichick might gonna, sign him off on Sunday. But he's going to do it on the weekend that you don't start him. Yeah, that's usually. Oh, maybe Adrian Peterson. Nah, it's another topic <laughs> for another day. Um, so, uh, why did you grow up in Jacksonville, or did you grow up I, in the area? I did. I was born and raised in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. I moved away from about twenty to twenty five, so I lived a little bit. Uh, of everywhere up and down the East Coast and Midwest, um, Orlando for a short time, and then I moved back to Jacksonville, and that's actually when I started Guys Girl because mm. I, you know, I, did, I graduated co- or I graduated high school with a slew of scholarships, you know, sort of the the, the type that knew exactly what I wanted to do. Right. Got to college, realized that I hated college, <laughs> that I just wanted to start. I, I wanted to jump. I already knew what I wanted to do business wise, and I just felt it was wasted time. It was wasted money to take these classes that that I had no need for that I, that I had no use for it felt like 13th and 14th grade almost mm. um, so that's when I, I got a little frustrated started moving around the country did a little soul searching moved back to Jacksonville and I was like okay I'm gonna do this I'm gonna start my own company and that's when I started guys girl and this is like a movie <laughs> like the entire like road trip meandering um, it's uh, that could be a montage like when Superman was just wandering around it's it's very I guess uh, stereotypical for mm. for a, a, a young girl to do some soul searching, but that's exactly what I did, no, it, and I moved back to Jacksonville at twenty five, and mm. and and it's sort of been a, a whirlwind ever since. No, it would be more stereotypical of the the basic white chick if you went backpacking through Europe and then fell in love with some guy on the the French co- French Riviera. Didn't quite work out. Yeah. Um. Well, that actually sounds fantastic too. Maybe I can make that in my in my my thirties goal. Yeah, you know, sidebar tangent. The everyone who takes a a, a a break year 
after college or before grad school before taking a job and then spends 10 15 grand backpack through europe they say it's like it was life-changing well it better be you just wasted a year and 10 <laughs> 15 grand man get to work it's certainly i can i can definitely agree with that aspect uh, i don't know it's like I, I don't know if you're wired this way, but I can't take a vacation. Like I honestly need like the daily busyness, the grind of working. And I, I'm a big creature habit. Like the wife mm. kind of wants to stab me in the eye with an ice pick because I, I won't vacation. I work Saturdays a lot. And I, I don't know. Are you like that? I, I'm a little bit of both. I love yeah. taking vacations. I love taking trips, especially if it's uh, out in you know a new place or out in the outdoors or, or something to almost force me to disconnect. Mm. Because if I'm not on a vacation, then I won't disconnect and I will stay in my work grind and I'll stay you know sort of in, nose to the grind and 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 work you know, 12, 13 hours a day. And, and that's no sweat for me. And I'll do it seven days a week. But I like to also I, I like to follow that mantra of work hard, play hard. Mm -hmm. So I work myself to death. And then I take a quick trip to remind myself of why I work so hard. And then I get back into the grind again. See, Blythe taking too much time off, not dedicated, sad. <laughs> Very sad. Plus, you're like an hour and a half from Disney. So it's like you have a vacation built in. Exactly. We've yeah. gone to Disney so many times over the years growing up here in Florida that 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 is our world away from the work world. Now, we just recently became like Twitter friends, which is good because uh, in years past, I've said some disparaging things about eastern Florida, calling it like a, a swamp backwater. But I'm mainly that's true. Mainly with my <laughs> the best thing is that you agree. Uh, <laughs> mainly it stems from. Uh, my previous engagements, mainly Teddy slash Bortles related with Jaguars Twitter, which is amazingly militant. <laughs> what did you do to anger Jaguars Twitter? I don't know. Maybe I threw Keenan McCardle under the bus or something. I can't remember. But I, 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 was, I was like, it, it's very quaint because they're, uh, everyone in eastern Florida is enamored because they just got dial up uh, internet. So I understand now. <laughs> Well, I would argue that's more of a resemblance for Central Florida, the Eastern Court. Yeah. If you're closer to the water, I feel like yeah. we're a little bit more civilized. Well, it, all the stories about a, a, Flor a Florida man ro robbed a gas station with an alligator today with a face tattoo. Like, Wait, all, listen, that's not always Florida natives. <laughs> no, everyone goes down to Florida to do crazy here. things. Yeah, it must it's be all the people who move here. Yeah. It must be the humidity that makes people do crazy things and like take bath salts and bite people's face off but oh. I, I feel like it, it, you guys got miami which is a very cosmopolitan area like jacksonville i'm sure is pretty nice too it, it must be like southern or no southern central western florida where all that crazy stuff happens it's usually okay well florida in general is a transplant state so there's very uh, small percentage of us though growing small percentage of us who are actually mm. born and raised in the state now, a lot of the crazy stories, I, I will say that from personal experience, that if I hear a crazy story and it's broadcasted over you know, national news, I, I silently pray to myself, please don't let it be Florida. Please don't let it be Florida. Please don't let it be Florida because we have this bad connotation with us. But on the other hand, there's so many people moving here that if we get mm -hmm. more of these bad stories out there, then maybe more people won't move here. That's sort of my thing. I like my my isolated beaches. I like my beautiful weather. I like 70 degrees on Christmas Day. I love all of those things. So if that helps, if the, the weird stories and, and we, you know, we got to take the L on somebody taking bath salts <laughs> and eating someone's face off to prevent 100,000 people from moving here, mm -hmm. I, I'm considering saying that's a positive. Now, Jacksonville, uh, compare it to another city in the United States for me. I would say... Probably Nashville. Mm. Um, we don't Nashville. have not not necessarily the music vibe mm. of of Nashville, but or the barbecue. I went to Nashville. <laughs> we do have great barbecue. We have a Jacksonville is actually one of the growing centers in the South for craft beer and food. Uh, it's one of the top cities in the country for millennials to move mm. to town. Um, it's a really great hub for entrepreneurs and tech startups. It's really uh, over the past five to ten years. It's really changed as far as like perception wise. We still have, especially living in 
what they call sort of South Georgia area, mm -hmm. where we're only about an hour away from Georgia. So we're closer yeah. to Georgia than we are to a lot of other cities in Florida. So we still have a lot of the same, uh, I guess, Southern values too. Mm -hmm. um, so we still, you know, it's, it's, it's a very friendly city, but it's also one of the largest small towns you'll ever visit. Um, there's lots of things to do. There's, you know, we're close to the water, we're close to the beach, we're close to the river. Um, and, and it is a beautiful city, but it's spread out. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would say that's probably the only downfall of it is that some of the traditions in the city are a little bit uh, slow to update. Like I think we just passed a couple months ago, the, the human rights ordinance, which which gives equal <laughs> rights to oh, wait, what? <laughs> to the LBGT community, which is sort of a, you would think that that should be a given that it would already be uh, considered a law or mm -hmm. co considered in people's minds. But there, there are still some, I guess, traditions, if you want to call it that, that are slow to change. And uh, that that's a little bit challenging, especially for a lot of the the entrepreneurs and the millennials moving to town. But the goal is, is that it's getting better. And it, it, even if it's slowly, but surely getting better, it's still getting a little bit there. Yeah. Now, was it just a law that everyone had already accepted anyways, but it was just a, a matter of paperwork where like oral sex is still illegal in Indiana? Well, that's a good, I did, I did not know that. Yeah. But <laughs> I would say that it was probably, I, among my my network of people, I, I would say that that the human rights ordinance was just mm. a, a, a given that I, I didn't know why you needed a law in order to pass it. But apparently it, it needed some convincing of some older city council members, um, some of the, the the mayor staff here locally in Jacksonville. So it was it was a matter of convincing them, not necessarily the population. Now, does Jacksonville have a big retiree community? A little bit, but not as much as, say, like Boca Raton mm -hmm. or, or cities further south, like, uh, you know, the Tampa area and the Miami area, Fort Lauderdale. Um, those are those to me in my eyes are, are bigger retirement areas than than further north in Florida. And the anywhere south of Orlando, really. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it is warmer. Sure. <laughs> uh, how come you guys haven't gotten another Super Bowl? I don't think we'll ever get another Super Bowl. And I think it's because uh, the city is is so spread out. C mm -hmm. Cities like New Orleans, um, Nashville is a, is a great example too. They're they're so uh, I, I guess close together, or their their stadium is very close to the downtown nightlife, and the downtown nightlife is very accommodating with several different hotels. Jacksonville is very large; it's the largest city by area in the country. So a lot of our our I, I guess our, our perks to the city are very spread out. So the the stadium is about mm -hmm. thirty minutes away from the beach even though it's on the river it's still a a, a good 30 minutes from the beach um we have some hotels downtown while we had the super bowl we had to actually bring in cruise, cruise ships. ships yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> we had to bring in cruise ships in order to accommodate everyone that was coming into town because you it, you could travel you could stay at the beach you mm. could stay at another area of town but Back then, it was just the taxi services that existed. We didn't have Ubers. We didn't have Lyfts, um, you know, private transportation on, on that level. But mm -hmm. now we have all of those things. Jacksonville really has grown since the Super Bowl. But I don't know that we'll ever get another one. I, I personally believe that the Super Bowl should be in, you know, like Miami. If they get a new stadium, it should be in New Orleans or it should be in L.A. or Vegas. One of those premier mm -hmm. uh, destination cities where people and fans want to actually travel to oh you're telling me that people don't want to go to minneapolis in february next year um i don't believe <laughs> unless your team is in the super bowl <laughs> probably not well we are sort of like indianapolis in that everything is centralized you know like the stadium is downtown like the local scene the bars the hotels everything is very tight-knit you know it isn't like Jacksonville, like I mentioned, or Arizona or Arlington, anything like that. But yeah, like we have a great Skyway system. Like if you get a downtown hotel, you actually don't have to go outside. Uh, like you'll be able to go all the way to the stadium and not take a step outside, which is oh, positive. Wow. But yeah, like that's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, li living here though for 29 plus years. Yeah. February, not great. I mean, just the, it's a, 
as a fan or as a Floridian, the idea mm. of, you know, negative temperatures or anything really under 70 degrees just gives me chills to my bones. So if, all right, so say the Jaguars <laughs> make the Super Bowl and then your, your, your overlords at the station are like, Blythe, we're sending you to Minnesota. I'm on oh. the first flight out. Oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> If my team is in the Super Bowl, I don't care if you're playing in, in Antarctica. I, w- I would go visit. I should start a company that rents out winter coats to people like who come from warm states. Who's like, why do I need to spend 100 bucks on a coat if I'm going to use it once? That's very true. Yeah. You probably shouldn't mention that. You should probably erase that portion from the podcast so uh, that no one steals that idea. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a nothing. <laughs> that, that's also one of my longstanding <laughs> traditions. Um, I, I saw that you have a lot of pictures with Shaq Khan. Yeah. Or, or sorry. <laughs> best buds. Or sorry, war, Wario. <laughs> he does have a very wario yeah. mustache. I don't know, that's cool. Though. I feel like in the pantheon of accessible NFL owners, he's definitely up there, if not number one. He is by far the best thing that's ever happened to Jacksonville because, well, I would say that the Jaguars coming to town first, Mm. what was the best, but him taking over as ownership is, is really, it's been an incredible thing. Fred Taylor's like, Hey, thanks. Exactly. Fred Taylor, Mark Brunel, Keenan McCardell, they're all, uh, well, Keenan McCardell is actually on the staff now as a wide receivers coach, Uh, I believe. So he's experienced a little bit. Yeah, no, I, I, our wide receiver coach moved on to be the uh, special teams coordinator of the Chargers, whatever. And I, I said, if he'd have taken that job a week earlier, we should have gone all in on McCardle because he coached Stephon Diggs in Maryland, and that would have been perfect. But you guys are jerks. It's okay. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> but not really. <laughs> uh, but so, what does Khan do uh, specifically that endears him to the fan base, or that why say- he's been good? He has consistently invested in the community, in the team, in the facilities. It, Jacksonville is, is sort of, especially with the news with the Raiders moving to Vegas and, you know, mm-hmm. the, I, three teams overall moving in the NFL, and none of them have been Jacksonville like a lot of people have predicted over the past decade or so. But he's really solidified that idea that the or not the idea but that the jaguars are staying in town he was doing an interview i think yesterday that said uh, and and somebody asked him about relocation rumors because obviously that's going to start up again with jacksonville now that oakland has a space open uh, maybe san antonio um, a couple of other cities across the united states including london maybe mexico city so they're all going to start throwing jacksonville into the mix but shot Khan's at an interview yesterday that actions speak louder than words mm-hmm. and his actions have been to beef up the locker rooms, which we have some of the best locker rooms in the entire country. Then we have these scoreboards additions, which are, I think, still the largest scoreboards in the world. And then they're also doing construction right now on a section of the stadium called Daly's Place, which is going to be an outdoor amphitheater and an indoor practice field for the players that have to deal with this, you know, god-awful Florida heat and humidity in the summer. Scoreboard or video board? Both. I guess oh. scoreboards and video boards. I guess it's kind of the, the uh, same thing, right? I was right? going to say, it would be awesome if it was a large video board, but if it's a large scoreboard, it's like, well, I, I guess you do have to cater to older people. Like, what's the score? I can't see. Oh, wait, well, no, it's, it's huge, yeah. It, it's kind of cool because on game days, they'll mm-hmm. have a section of the scoreboard that's dedicated to, you know, like fan pictures and, and things like that and sponsors. And then on the other side, they'll have it dedicated to, you know, the, the score and the time left on the clock and all that good stuff. And then in the middle is where they show like the live video feeds, uh, you know, the refs, the game, um, any kind of video presentations that go on. Because the Jaguars, ha- I mean, I'm, I don't have much experience looking at the videos at other NFL teams create, but the ones that the Jaguars create are really, really outstanding. They have a fabulous video department and they, they create some really great mashups. Like when star Wars first came out, they created a mashup with the the Jaguars and star Wars. And, mm-hmm. they, and they just do little things like that, that, um, that really go above and beyond for the fans. Yeah. Uh, just reading up on con. Like I love a guy who has very humble beginnings and builds himself up. It's American dream. It's you know, what, what I'm attempting to do as well. Also, the best thing is that he's from uh, Punjab, Pakistan. Yep, he was an he was an immigrant that migrated over. I think at the age eleven years old, mm. and he lived in Chicago. Worked at the the you know sort of the 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 bottom of the deck as far as employees are concerned. Worked up to the point where he could buy the company and then started his own bumper company. Mm. 
like car bumpers, and that's how he made the majority of his money. Um, and since then, he he is he's been wanting to get into the NFL for quite some time. He tried to buy the St. Louis Rams years back, but Stan Kroenke yeah. overruled him and ended up purchasing the entire portion of the Rams, and then since moved them to LA. Mm. So it's sort of it, it, it's sort of uh, I guess crazy to see the the chain of events that happened that if. Shot Khan would have been able to buy the Rams. They probably would still be in St. Louis, but we're we're happy to have him as our owner in Jacksonville because we Man. don't have to to fight off those rumors anymore. Yeah. You guys could have ended up with Cronky, and you guys already be London Jaguars. Exactly. I, it, there's no there's zero doubt in my mind that if we were to have any other owner, well, a lot of different owners, but mm. but Khan has been a, a a huge blessing to the city, and he's invested a lot of his own money into the stadium upgrades, into the city of Jacksonville itself. He, he's purchased a slew of businesses and buildings, and he's building those up as we speak. Uh, what percentage would you say in, in your lifetime the Jaguars end up moving? The only time I was really worried that was in 2009. Mm. And that was a season that we sort of still get made fun of a lot as far as blackouts are, are concerned. We haven't had a blackout since 2009, but in 2009, all of our home games were blacked out except for one. Well, no, so that uh, was, I, I, I've seen your games. Most of your fans are blacked out by, by halftime. Well, you kind of have to if you, you know, you only get 15 wins over the past four years. Yeah. So we always, Jaguar fans had this sort of moniker that we win the off season and we win the tailgate. It's really, <laughs> the, the, the tailgate That's is good. the only like thing that. that we can control. Mm. Um, but the off season as well, the, the off season, we are, um, I think, three-time champs as far as off seasons are concerned. Yeah, Mal- Malik Jackson, that's exciting. Very Two years ago. Yeah. Uh, who'd you guys sign this off season? Oh, this off season. Oh, b- besides we, former uh, Vikings legend Audie Cole, <laughs> we signed this off season. Um, we brought in a couple O linemen. We brought in some uh, defensive linemen. Who else did we? AJ Bouye was a big oh, yeah. get for us. Um, outside of Bouye, it was. I know we signed a tackle, and then we signed another. Uh, Church is one of them, mm-hmm. a defensive lineman, and then Bouye to play opposite of Ramsey. And then a couple other guys. Uh, who was the offensive tackle from Miami that we actually traded for? Oh, uh, Brandon Albert. Yes. So we got him. Um, that that was a big get too. How come you guys don't play Miles Jack? Like, if you don't want him, we'll take him. <laughs> I I would say that's a question for the previous coaching regime. Yeah. Who, thank the Lord, is no well. I can't really say is no longer with the team because they promoted interim head coach Doug Marone to the head coaching staff. But um, I guess Gus Bradley is going to kind of be the fall guy for that, for, for the scheme that he yeah. ran. And, um, and we should, based off of their off season moves, we should see miles Jack play more of a predominant role. But I think a lot of the moves from last year and the year before have been to try to play the vet Paul Puz Lesney. Um, but and he's so he, old. I, he's, he's just old. He's old. And he's he so makes old. A, <laughs> and he makes a, I, I think they keep him on the field more for his, I guess, leadership capabilities. Mm. Um, he, he calls a lot of the plays on the defensive side of the ball, and they didn't feel that Miles Jack was ready for that yet. Yeah. But my thing is, is that when, how are you going to prep him? How are you going to get him ready if you don't let him see game time? Mm. You won, what, three three games last year, three, four games last year? Like, it, it, I would think that much like a rookie quarterback, you would want to get him the reps. And why not get him the reps on a losing football team when you have an aging guy and, and a guy like Paws who is probably not going to see the field in two years? Oh, yeah. You got to send Calais Campbell, too. That's big. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we did. Campbell, Albert, Bouye. Yeah. You guys have a lot of young talent, except it just doesn't add up. Like, the Jaguars, for the past three years, have been everyone sort of sleeper sneaky. If everything goes right, they can make a playoff run. And then, feh. It's and, and I want to say it's sort of the the situation that they, they sort of painted themselves into a corner. Mm-hmm. Because if you have... What we had in Jacksonville is that they retooled completely the, the team. They, they blew it all up four years ago. And you had a rookie GM and Dave Caldwell. You had a rookie head coach and Gus Bradley. You had a rookie quarterback and Blake Bortles. And then you had a very, very young football team. So we really had no leaders on this team, both on the field and in the front office, that could really say this is, the, the, this is how we're going to right this ship. This is how we're going to get to the goal of getting eventually to a Super Bowl. And that's sort of laughable that you – 
that I can even mention that in the same sentence when talking about the Jaguars. Um, but we all got to, I guess, have a little hope. And I think with this franchise, with the signing of Tom Coughlin in the offseason, that's really what this this franchise needed a veteran voice, a veteran leader. And especially with, with Shot Khan, he, he's a rookie NFL owner, too. Mm-hmm. And he's sort of new to all of this. And so I think he. Well, he aren't aren't all place, owners rookie NFL owners? I, yeah, I guess so. They are rookie NFL owners, but it sort of all happened at the same time that mm-hmm. he took over ownership. He brought in his staff that were all rookies at their position. They they had never been a head coach had never been a GM before. Um, Blake Bortles was a new quarterback. So we had a very, um, I guess, inexperienced team, both in the front office and on the field. But with the addition of Tom Coughlin in the offseason, uh, that is essentially the only reason that I renewed my season tickets is because of Tom Coughlin. Now, as an old old school fan who'd been there from the beginning, well, not kind of old, but you know what I mean, uh, would you have preferred to see Tom Coughlin step in as the head coach and Doug Marone sort of told to kick the bricks or not? I would have preferred I, – I, I love Tom Coughlin and his role of VP of football operations. Mm-hmm. That That's where I think he's going to provide the most value to the team. I wasn't happy about Doug Marone staying on as head coach because <laughs> – and, and yeah. especially with the way that they announced it because they announced it completely backwards. So the Jaguars announced that Doug Marone was going to be retained as the head coach – after doing all of these head coaching searches, and then they announced that Tom Coughlin was joining the squad as well. And I, 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 I just didn't agree with that. I thought that they should have announced Tom Coughlin first and then announce his decision mm. to retain Doug Marone. I felt like that would have had a little bit more authority. So what you have was this Jaguars Twitter wave of emotions where you have to deal with the same guy who's been there for four years of BS, mm. and then you're going to bring in Tom Coughlin, and that's supposed to fix everything. And, and it, it, at this point, you, you hope it does. Um, and it has slowly but surely, I think. Um, we're we're only into one off season, but the hiring of Tom Coughlin makes me feel much better about Doug Marone. But it's sort of a, a, a cautious optimism. You know, Shaq Khan loves the fan base, isn't afraid to spend money. I, I just would have loved for him to be like, "Here's what's going to happen, M- my friend Nick Saban, fifteen million dollars a year, and three percent of the team." What do you say? You would have you would have got him. It probably. Uh, especially with Saban and, and yeah. this, he likes to control the media. He likes a uh, small, not necessarily Alabama's not mm. a, it's not a small football market, but a small media market. And yep. so he would have liked to have that control over the team and the small media market. And yeah, warm weather, no state income tax. He could have been really happy and avenge his last stint in the NFL in Florida. Did you? It, it, it's crazy because I often think about how much different things would have been in Miami and in the NF or the AFC East mm-hmm. if Saban would have stayed there, if he would have gotten his choice at quarterback with Drew Brees. Um, but there was one trainer, I think, in Miami that looked at uh, Brees' shoulder and said that, no, you don't want to get him. And so if Brees oh. would have ended up in Miami with Saban going against Belichick and the Patriots. I think that would have been an incredible dynasty hey, to, to don't, witness. Don't you years. dare besmirch the memory of Dante Jerome Culpepper, okay? <laughs> he, he's still real to me, damn it. <laughs> I'm sure, just like uh, Teddy Bridgewater's knee. Yeah. Yeah, the Vikings have very bad luck with quarterbacks. Either they, they get injured or they're old and decrepit like Brett Favre. That, that's the same with the Jaguars, too. Yeah. It's, it's it's sort of, uh, I guess, the crux of this franchise is that you can't find a decent quarterback. And if you, you do have someone that's halfway decent, yeah. that's nowhere near Hall of Fame quality, you put him up in the pride like Mark Rennell. Uh, ooh, random aside, you guys still have the rights to Justin Blackman? <laughs> We do. <laughs> That's amazing. I think I think we still do, unless yep. something changed at the end of last season where he officially retired. I want to say that he officially retired now. Mm. But I mean we we've sort of given up on that yeah. on that train a while ago. You guys should bring in Josh Gordon. That might be a good fix. It's kind of a stud. I, I I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> no, no. Like we haven't talked much about Blake Bortles. We'll get into him, but you should bring in Manziel. I mean, just come on, Yolo stuff. Like Manziel is made for an NFL team that has a pool in the stadium. It, it, it just has to be. And a small media market that won't be afraid yeah. to call him out, or will be afraid to call him out. I guess he can have all the fun. He would that be he amazing at the, at the Jack Speech bars, and probably no one would report on it. It would be phenomenal. 
I, I'm all for competition at the mm. quarterback position because I am I, I'm about the faith level of Blake Bortles being our guy is about 25 percent for me. I'm still willing to see him battle it out competition wise this upcoming season. But I, I, I think that the Jaguar, this is a bad draft to adjust mm-hmm. the court or to address the quarterback position. Um, so I, I definitely think that they can, they should bring in, you know, the, Colin Kaepernick, they should bring in Jay Cutler. They should bring in Manziel. They should bring yep. in anybody that's going to give Blake Bortles competition because Chad Henney isn't providing that right now. Although they don't have a fantastic of a Fu Manchu as Chad Henney. No, he, he did that that gif where he has a mustache and he's sh- slowly shaking his mm. head will live, I think, in Jaguars gif history. Uh, do you think the Jaguars pick up Bortles fifth year option? Because, you know, being the third overall pick, that's going to be a pretty penny coming up. No, I, I, I don't. I don't think they will. I think mm. they'll give him this year to prove it. And if he doesn't prove it, then they'll cut ties and they'll move on. D- Tom Coughlin has been very. um he has said, you know, Blake Bortles is our is our quarterback at this time, uh, but he's not afraid to adju- address that position. And he's gotten rid of a few people on this team like Jared Audrick. Mm. And he was and, and he made some pretty good plays for the Jaguars over the past couple of years. But I think that that was more of a personality fit or lack thereof. Mm. And Coughlin has proven that he's going to get rid of these guys that aren't team first mentality and, and Bortles for as much as he struggled this past year, he is very much a team first guy. He will, he will shoulder the blame for, for all as he should, you know, the, the, the quarterback is the most position or most important position on the field. And you sort of live or die by the play of your quarterback. And he was not good. He was terrible last year and he owned up to it each time. And so it, it for as little, credit as as he deserves that that's one area that he does he does deserve a lot of credit he never once blamed any of the fans he said i i i real i understand why they're booing um i would boo too if i showed up and saw a performance like that so he mm-hmm. is he says a lot of the right things he shows up to work um he, he's known around the team as the first guy to show up the last one to leave very much a team guy that's because he's waiting um, for his mom to pick him up <laughs> but he's he's um he, he's got to put it together on the field and and that's where it matters most i don't care how much of a team guy you are if you're not putting it together on the field then we got to move on to somebody else i, I really hope blake bortle's mom is still alive because I, I, I always have bad luck with those sort of asides <laughs> yeah. your mom jokes and then yeah. you find out that they're they're deceased yeah all right so just going back to like the middle school playground it was like um, you're insulting another guy, someone you just met him as like, yeah, your mom is so fat and blah, blah, blah. And he's like, my mom's dead. The, the best part of it is when you call the bluff and re-raise, be like, no, she's not. And then he folds. He's like, yeah, 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 right. she, yeah she's alive. She's picking me up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a theory about Blake Bortles where it's a bit of a Samson scenario, you know, Samson and Delilah, where when he dumped uh, Lindsey Duke, the phenomenal Lindsey Duke, uh, ah, yes. it, his play definitely went down because his first couple of years, he was I he, he wasn't terrible. Uh, he's a little rough around the edges still. You know, you can't really teach 6'4", 220 or however big he is. And then as soon as he broke up with Lindsey Duke, it, the play went downhill and also his hair left him like he, he's bald as shit now. It's, it's dramatic. Yeah. Changing life. It's quality. amazing. But he wears a hat all the time. So you won't be able to tell unless mm. it's during the the national anthem. So when <laughs> so when he cut off Lindsey Duke, it was like when Samson cut off his hair. He lost all his power and and his hair. <laughs> it's very analogous. <laughs> now I would I would argue that there's there's definitely a correlation there that should be investigated further. Though I do mm. hear that they are on good terms again, Lindsey Duke and Blake Ooh. Bortles, because they follow mm. each, not good terms where they're dating again, but oh. they follow each other on social media now. So <laughs> that should mean at least uh, maybe some of his hair will grow back now. Um, I, I, I love well, I, I love slash hate that that's the state of sports media reporting now uh like uh, up here is like ricky rubio followed christops porzingis on twitter before the trade deadline does that mean he's going to be a nick that's like ah, kill me yes <laughs> all throughout nfl free agency mm. it was watching who's following who or, or watching those tweets as people yeah. report on them and i said wow oh. this is this is the state of our professional media now i love the players were aware of it and started trolling the media, just like <laughs> tweeting out one emoji and then having the media and the fans trying to decipher it. It was a game. It was fun. <laughs> it was dance puppets. Yeah. 
Uh, that's why I, I do love sports. It, it's great theater. You know, the the whole uh, Shakespeare thing of all the world's a stage and we're just the players. Yeah, like NFL offseason is fascinating to me. Like, I, I care more about the NFL offseason than I do March Madness, which I don't give two shits about, really. I, I completely agree. I did not do a bracket this year. I, I found myself over the past mm. few years doing a bracket just because everybody else was doing it. I said, you know what? I'm not going to do one this year, and I haven't missed it. I, I filled one out. I got Gonzaga winning against UNC, so I'm like, come on, baby. Bring home that bacon. <laughs> yeah. um, getting back to the quarterback thing, how, how do you want the team to address it? Because I, I know that you got Blake Bortles who doesn't take care of the ball, and then you're like, hey, let's bring in Cutler and Kaepernick who <laughs> – also don't take care of the ball, but would you be upset if the Jaguars took a quarterback at four? I would say in this particular draft, yes, mm. just because of the, the the play of the quarterbacks. While Deshaun Watson is, is great, mm. um, I just don't think he warrants that pick at four overall. Any, any of the quarterbacks in this draft, you're going to have to make them wait a year in order for them to play. You're going to mm. have to make them sit and learn behind somebody, and I don't want anybody learning behind Blake Bortles. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, I think the nut low would be if you guys got Mitch Trubisky and was like <laughs> boring. <laughs> That's such a Jacksonville name too. Mitch. Yeah. Oh no. He's, he's Mitchell now. He, oh man. He, he wants oh, that to be known. Me. Ugh, That's which, right. Which is even worse. Yeah. Um, so cosplay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Nice transition. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I do my homework. <laughs> so w- w- fill us in. What's with cosplay? Sure. So so cosplay is when you like a character in usually video games or music – or not music uh, – video games, movies, um, TV, and you take their costume and you either – buy the materials online or what a lot of cosplayers do is they make it themselves. Mm -hmm. So using um, a a good example, I've I've done this for years for a local company called GAM. It stands for Games, Art, and Music. And they hold annual conventions or annual events where they invite the gaming community to all participate and people show up in costumes and you can listen to music and bid on different art auctions and things like that. So what will happen with a lot of these cosplayers is that they'll spend weeks, sometimes months crafting these costumes and they look incredible. And then they'll show up at these different events and they'll, they'll pretend like they're the character. Um, They'll interact with people. They'll take a bunch of pictures. um, And then they'll usually have some drinks and end up on the dance floor dressing in like full costume. It's pretty fantastic. All right. Now (laughs) you don't have to talk from personal experience, but do some of these convention participants eventually make their way up to the hotel room and then in full costume and regalia kind of, you know, I'm sure that definitely a lot of that goes on. I mean, I would say, God, what is with Florida? (laughs) These are, I mean, a lot of these, you know, San Diego comic con, New York comic con, um, any of the, any kind of cons really, Uh, this is where you'll see a lot of people showing up in their costumes. Sometimes they, they show up in older costumes or newer ones, uh, just depending on what they've been working on. But a lot of these people are really, really good craftsmen and uh, seamstresses. And they, mm-hmm. it, it, some of the work that they produce is is yeah. fantastic. Uh, I don't know if I'd use craftsmen because that, that makes you think of like a, like a blacksmith or, or like, a, like a sword um, maker. But, well, there, some of these guys are. There, some of them are professional. Oh, some of them probably makers. do dress up as, as swords makers. That, that's a role in Game of Thrones, probably. <laughs> well, they, and then they, well, they'll make their own. Um, like over the weekend, I was at a shoot for um, a GAM event that's coming up in August, mm-hmm. and uh, they, they had the Master Sword there. And anybody who is familiar with the Legend of Zelda series, you know what the Master Sword is. And it was created by a local prop maker, and he he wielded the the the, the sword himself. He created it himself. He made it. He made the handle for it. He made the the holder that the sword goes into. I mean, a, a very like real sword that looks just like the master sword uh and he, and he that's not the only thing he's done other like shields and you know the captain america shield mm. um some other different props that he's made but it it's a serious it, it it's a serious business and some people 
it, you can tell the people who put extra time into their cosplay because you can tell in, in the work whenever they show up to an event. They, they use mm. uh, foam, they use wood, they use any kind of materials that can get the look of the costume that they're trying to achieve. You know what would probably be the most insulting thing to those cosplayers? If, um, going back to them banging each other, if Uhura, Lieutenant Uhura from Star Trek had sex with Darth Vader from Star Wars in full costume, that, that would like blow up nerds' minds. They're like, you can't do that. Probably. It, it definitely would. But, I mean, after these guys have a few drinks, I think it's mm. sort of um, it, that sort of plays it up even more, the forbidden. Yeah, Trek Wars, let's do this. <laughs> yeah. uh, what's been your favorite costume? I would say... Because some costumes are uncomfortable to wear. Mm -hmm. So probably I would most probably, of them. Yeah, yeah, especially for girls, um, especially back in, in the day when I would buy my costumes mm -hmm. online. And so you have to get like the cheap version of the costumes before I started yep. making them myself. Um, I would say my favorite costume as of recent is Sonya Blade, or oh. I was. Uh, Sonya Blade from Mortal Kombat. She's yeah. the first female character ever in that series. Or uh, years ago, I was the Adam West version of Batman, mm. and I had a utility belt with like smoke bombs and smoke grenades, and um, I had. You, you'd a be sharp arrested repellent. by ho Homeland Security now. <laughs> but, like fireworks, like yeah. uh, like. Pretend like I bought them off Amazon, um, but pretend, you know, little little fireworks that you keep in your utility belt. It had shark repellent spray that was filled with vodka. Um, yeah, so little things like that. That I, I love a good utility belt. Mm. And any costume that I can have a utility belt with that frees up my hands, I can put my cell phone in it, I can put my lipstick in it, and then you can sort of have fun for the entire night. Yeah, I, I feel like um, most cosplay costumes for females are going to be pretty restrictive pretty revealing because nerds and their computer graphic design like comic books graph uh, video games yeah they're uh, they're gonna have a pretty good imagination of repressedness <laughs> well it's sort of yes and also there, there's another i guess sort of sweet side to it yeah. too because anytime you go to to some of these events you can tell the people who who don't necessarily, I guess, get out much. Mm. And this is where they go to meet up with a lot of their internet friends, um, a lot of relationships that they've built, you yeah. know, through the internet, but have never really met in person or never really hung out in person with a few drinks. So you can see them mm. sort of letting loose and having fun in their own little elements. And, and that to me... It's, it, it, I don't want to say it makes me cry, but it's really, really sweet to see. Uh, please, please don't tell me that they call each other by their screen names or, or like um, their, would... the, their Steam clan name or whatever the video game thing is. Well, I will argue that I've been to a lot of Jaguar tweet, Jaguar uh... Twitter meetups, and you don't know people's real names. So mm. you had the little um, the, the little sticky pad that you write your Twitter handle on it, and that's how you, you put a face <laughs> to a name. So it sort of works both ways, I think. Yeah. Now, uh, last thing on this cosplay thing, uh, being a, you know, uh, objectively, I, I will say that you are a wonderful looking um, person, if I may be oh, so bold. Thank you. And if you're dressed up in a, in a, you know, pretty revealing costume and one of those cosplay things, it's got to be um, nice for you. It's like, yeah, none of these guys are going to come up and hit on me because they got no game. Like, th they're probably, their mom dropped them off. They, they don't have any vitamin D because they've been in the basement for hours. And it's not like you know, walking to a bar where, you know, like, 17 douchebags will hit on you. You're like, you, you can walk around in, in, with impunity. You're untouchable. I would say that's pretty accurate. The, the most interaction uh. that I have at these cosplay events, I, I usually come with a, a group of friends. And I'm usually the only person that dresses up. And the, the rest of the group will wear, you know, just like a Captain America t-shirt or something like that. That's usually what my brother wears to it is just a regular t-shirt. Meanwhile, I'm in full costume. So that, I think, going with my brother to a lot of these different <laughs> events has helped in that regard. Because I will say that I went to uh, a, one of these events recently, and my brother wasn't able to go. So I'm dressed as a pink Power Ranger in a very skin tight costume, and mm. you can feel eyes on you. But I mean, you just have to find a good group to hang out with, and then the the creepiness level from other people is is sort of subdued. <laughs> and very smooth segue for me, quasi objectifying <laughs> you to asking about women in media. 
<laughs> Apologies for that, by the way. Uh, no worries at all. Uh, so with your role in, in the media, do you see yourself having to be a like a torchbearer for women in the media, a bit of a, a pathfinder, a someone who has to set an example, or do you just do your thing? I sort of just do my thing. Mm. I, I don't... I think that there is a lot of, especially with women who cover sports, I think that there's a lot in the industry of we're not being treated fairly and we're not being treated like other mainstream reporters. And, and, and to some extent, that's true. But to the majority of the extent, it's once you reach a certain level of popularity and you have an opinion on something, you're going to get a little bit of a backlash. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what your opinion is is you're, you're going to get people that disagree with you. And so I think that there's a rush to judgment out there for, for some women that think that they're being picked on just because they're a woman yep. and it's no, you, you have an opinion. And if you have a strong opinion, then you're going to get backlash for it. And most internet trolls are going to go for the first thing that they notice that they can make fun of you for. And if mm -hmm. it happens to be a woman or if it happens to be race or, or, or something along those lines, you do have idiots out there that are going to – that's going to be the first thing that they jump to because they want to cut you the deepest. But yeah. I, I don't want to say it comes with – it shouldn't come with the territory, but it does come with the territory. Um, so I, I sort of just do my own thing. I, I don't really buy into the fact that I am essentially getting mistreated because I'm a woman. Mm -hmm. I think – if there's any kind of mistreatment, it's because of your opinion, not necessarily because you're a woman. Yeah, I, I think that's a good attitude to have, and also being uh, also I, I have a bit of the 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 card too, since I'm a minority. Although I don't really play that card, I you know, I, whatever. Uh, but I feel like a lot of people do, like you said, once they get some pushback or some if they have a bad take on something, that they automatically go to, oh, this is because I'm a woman or a minority or a homosexual or trans or whatever. And I, I, I don't think that's healthy. And also, it, it could be that we are an enlightened society who do believe in equality. And if you have a shitty take, it, we're going to call you out on it, whether you're a man, woman, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if the person retreats to, oh, this is because I'm X, that it's sort of uh, nonproductive. Yeah, it, it, a great example of, of that and sort of I, – because I – I've sort of realized this transition in social media, especially on Twitter, starting with this past football season, that it's just become sort of a, a pitchfork society mm -hmm. where people want to get they, they what is um that there's a comedian that calls it. What are you getting fake mad about today where <laughs> you have this fake criticism of something that you're supposedly passionate about and you're mad about it for about two hours or a day, and then the next day you move on with being mad about something else. That and, and, and it's just this vicious cycle where you're not necessarily doing anything about it or to correct the situation. All you're doing is just bitching about it online and expecting mm -hmm. it to get better. I, I, I think a great example is uh, the, the Women's March that just happened mm -hmm. on, uh, I think it was International Women's Day, that you saw women from all over the country that were marching in order – in, in, to I guess to threaten Donald Trump to not take their rights away. No rights have been taken away yet. Mm -hmm. But if those same women in those same cities would have instead used their power, would have instead volunteered in the community, make their community and their surrounding areas a better place, I feel like that would have had much greater impact than what was essentially just marching for the sake of marching. And and that's where I, I'm more about action mm -hmm. and and bettering the situation situation rather than just complaining about it online. See, I, I uh, honestly wonder if there was no social media and you couldn't put out a tweet or an Instagram uh, at a March or uh, showing support for a cause X Y Z. I, I feel like protests and demonstrations and and uh, things like that would fall like precipitously. I, I think they would too because I think there's sort of a, a narcissism mm. in, involved with a lot of it in that you you we see it a lot with uh, domestic violence cases in in sports where if something happens where you'll see a flock of people run to the internet and proclaim how much they are against domestic violence mm. but the tweet is to the extent of what they actually do to help out the situation yep. and I know that some would argue that 
well, you're using your voice as a platform. Well, that's, I mean, unless you have more than a million followers, that's really just a, a crock of shit. Um, <laughs> they, they, you're, you're not doing anything to, to better your community. And, and I, I, I just fall in line with the thinking of what can you do? What can you do with the two hands that you have and what, how can you better your community that you're in right now? Because that's the greatest change that you're going to see and you're going to directly impact instead of going online and complaining, which a majority of people already do and it hasn't helped at all. I, I knew I liked you, Vlad. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> No, th this is some great level-headed thinking, and uh, uh, this isn't just like two people agreeing, like which is very prevalent today, especially in politics. But just the the moderate view of, hey, if you're actually truly passionate about something, do something more than just tweet. Don't be a, a couch activist. It, it accomplishes nothing other than making you feel better for a couple seconds. Like, yeah, I, I stand for what's what's right. It's like you almost feel better about yourself mm. because you sent that tweet versus if yeah. you were to go and and there's a great local charity here in Jacksonville called um, Generation Works and it got together thousands of women from all over the city mm. and they went to different charities. Each group was assigned a different charity or a different school and they went to that charity or they went to that school and they helped them with painting and landscaping, um, site cleanup, little things that better your community. And I just, it, it was sort of an eye opening thing for me that if, if more groups like that took ownership in their own community, how much better this world would be instead of people going to social media and, and, and bitching about something that they'll never, they're like, never will have a positive effect and change. See, just going back a, a year or two that I think that's, that was the genius of the ALS ice bucket challenge. In that it, it raised awareness, it raised money, and uh, it combined with people's narcissism. Just like insane narcissism of like, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm going to feel good. I challenge you, my friends, to look good and feel good and uh, bring attention to yourself. And it worked. It, it raised a lot of funds. They made a couple of breakthroughs on that. And it, it's a sad state that it's almost uh, you have to have that carrot out in front of the donkey to make it move. But... Hey, if you can, uh, if you can make it work, more power to you. Absolutely. If you can find a way to channel social media or the, yeah. the passion behind people on social media into a cause that that's, that's really the, the golden ticket, I think. And, and they capitalized on that. And I don't know that there's been another charity that has really since mm -hmm. capitalized on something like that. The closest thing I can think of is when Ezekiel Elliott jumped into the Salvation Army bin, uh, but yeah. that wasn't really anybody yeah. else doing that except for him. Like it just, it, it unconsciously or, or unintended, it had really great unintentions, I guess mm. I should say. Uh, uh, unintentions. I like that word. Is that a real word? I don't know if it is, but no, I just made I, it I up. make up words all the time. I, I feel like <laughs> we, we could fill an urban dictionary ourselves. <laughs> except we're, we're not urban. You know what I mean? Yeah. The, oh, uh, except uh, I, yeah, I think uh, the, oh, Zeke's, uh, you know, pulling down into that chick's uh, bikini. Yeah, I don't think that's going to catch on. Although, oh, no, I I don't think so. Although it should. Not? Maybe the, <laughs> what was it? Uh, oh, they call it sharking. Like when you fall down the top. Uh, the sharking challenge. The, yeah. Spread the sharking the, challenge? I may have made just made that up. Or it may be from 30 Rock. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, Vlad, I had you for an hour. And uh, I really appreciate you. Really appreciate you coming in. Uh, one last question, and then we'll get you out of here. Uh, so you obviously hustle. Love and respect that. Uh, what's your typical day like? My typical day has actually recently changed because um, I, I made the move into freelancing full time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been doing this. I, I said earlier in the show that I've been doing this blogging thing since 2009. It's opened up a lot of different doors for me experience wise. So I finally decided to, to take the plunge. And as of three weeks ago, I started freelancing full time. So what I do now, my Sort of the, the the run of the mill day for me is that I wake up in the morning, I make some sales, uh, follow up email, uh, create some content for. Um, I run four different websites, so I create content for each one of those websites, um, and then I also sell digital services as far as like web design, um, mm. inbound marketing goals, things like that. So I sell those services to other brands and companies, and and that's really what my day involves. I have helmets and heels radio show here in Jacksonville on Tuesday nights uh, during the season. I help out with some of the pregame coverage. And then uh, also during the season, I have the Guys Girl Show, which I cover um, 
national sports and entertainment topics. I do have another podcast that I'm going to be launching here soon that's going to be more educational for other sports media personalities that want to sort of get their their foot in the door with with digital marketing as far as websites mm -hmm. and social media and all that is concerned. Wow. You make me, <laughs> you, uh, I, I thought I worked hard, but you actually make me look like a, like a vegetable. Oh, no, 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 not, not at all. That, that's a, it's, I, I work with a team of, of yeah. really great people and, um, I, I'm, I'm very, I consider myself very lucky to be able to do what I do. See, that's what people who always bust their ass say. I'm very lucky <laughs> and I have a lot of smart people around me. Well, that's, that's really the only way that I think yeah. you can get better is with your career is working with other smart people. Right. Follow her on Twitter at Bly the Blum, Bly the Brumlove. Uh, don't be a stranger. Appreciate you. Thank you for having me. Now, I, I pretty much say this about every interview is that time flies by and it's true. Time does fly by with most of these interviews, mainly because uh, uh, I, I like talking to people. Yeah, I, I feel like I can get the most out of people, and uh, it's very Larry Kingish. Like, expand on that. Call her. We got Albuquerque in here. Yeah, but with Blythe, it was like it, it truly uh, meant what I said. We could have talked for four hours, and we would be none the wiser. Like we we would find interesting topics. We're we'll probably going to cosplay a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but really appreciate her coming on. And also, hey, appreciate you shopping on our Amazon link, bullshow.co slash Amazon. Here's what you do. It'll take you right to the homepage through our link. Drag that little special link down to your bookmark bar. And every time you buy something on Amazon, use that link. And it's one of the oldest and best ways to help support the show because it's something you already do. It's something you literally already do is shop on Amazon. Do it through us, and we'll get a little credit and a couple nickels in our pocket. Keep the pirate ship rolling along. Baby, bullshow.co slash Amazon. All right, we'll be right back on Friday. Yeah, it'll be good times. iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and like us on Facebook. If you enjoy the show, spread the word. Tell a friend. Add to the Jerome homie army. And thanks, producer Ali Sorensen, for making me not sound so stupid today. But for Blythe, I'm Andy. Then and Young, Sinar, and bye bye. We'll talk to you Friday. To Bull with Andy Carlson, Minnesota's 87th best daily podcast. Download the show on iTunes. Everyone's middle name is Jerome.